Praise be Jesus Christ. A warm welcome to all my dear students. Thank you again for enrolling in my school of reading. And a special welcome to any new students. We're so glad you joined us. So, as you can see, the moment we've all been waiting for, I finally have the fire again going in my wood stove. I'm going to give you the temperature update up here in Canada. This morning, it is 10 degrees Celsius, which is 51 degrees Fahrenheit. So, cool enough to justify uh, a little fire this morning to uh, warm things up. It'll be nice and warm during the day today, but now we're getting the colder nights. Okay, so this is our last teaching on the Father Speaks to His Children. And what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the Rublev icon. This is the icon that has a representation of the Holy Trinity. And we're focusing in a particular way on the, uh, the angel that represents God the Father because this seated angel, no beard, look at the colors, is very similar to Mother Eugenia's description of God the Father. And so the uh, icon we have of God the Father uh, kind of comes from this Rublev icon. So we're going to get into that today, looking at the Rublev icon, which you should have all received a copy of. When you were sent a copy of The Father Speaks to His Children, you should have also received a little uh, prayer card with the Rublev icon and an additional prayer card with the um, Abba Deus, the God the Father icon. If you're a student and you haven't received your book with the icons yet, please please send an email because every student is supposed to have received um, this little book. It, it takes sometimes as many as three weeks for the books to get to people. So if you just signed up for the School of Reading in the last couple of days, maybe don't send an email <laughs> until maybe three weeks has gone by. Um, okay, now before we get into the Rublev icon, I just want to mention that it, for the month of September, we're going to be studying one of the most recent uh, documents from the Vatican, and it, it's a letter on the great Catholic mathematician and philosopher, Blaise Pascal. He's just a beloved philosopher, and what we're going to do is we're going to st uh, read uh, the, the Vatican document, which is quite short, but also I'm going to send you a link for his thoughts. That's what he's most well known for, his pensées, his thoughts, and um, maybe a little, just a short little biography on him too. Uh, I think next Monday uh, there won't be a School of Reading teaching. I'm going to try to update my intro to the School of Reading uh, video hopefully next Monday. So uh, I'm giving you a week off and then the second week of September we'll get into the uh, Blaise Pascal readings. Okay, so let's get into the Rublev icon. I want to begin by reading to you from Genesis chapter 18, which is the story from the Bible that where we get the icon from. So Genesis 18, it says, and the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre, that's Abraham, as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men stood in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, My Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree, while I fetch a morsel of bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after you have, may, after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to, uh, to Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf, 
which she had prepared, and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. And so that's what we see in the Rublev icon. <clears throat> these three men, these three angels, these, these three persons, beings, um, sitting at the table, eating. And I just want to read to you again from Cardinal Reniero Cantalamese's book, Contemplating the Trinity, where he speaks of the Rublev icon, which, by the way, was... Uh, uh, they say you don't paint an icon, you write an icon. And they say you don't just look at an icon, you read the icon. There's a lot of meaning in it. But anyways, it was written, painted by Andrei Rublev, in around 1410. And again, it's a Russian icon and it's in Moscow. But Cardinal Cantalamesa says, this icon was declared to be the model of all representations of the Trinity in 1551 by the Council of 100 Chapters. It depicts the three angels who appeared to Abraham by the Oaks of Mamre. It is read by the patristic tradition as an early prefigurement of the Trinity. The icon is one of the artistic forms that follow a spiritual reading of the Bible. It is thus not, to, not the atemporal trinity that is represented, but the trinity of salvation history. So I don't know if you caught that. He's saying it's not the atemporal trinity. The trinity is beyond time. The trinity is, is infinite, uh, transcendent, uh, uh, we're unable to ever fully grasp the wonder and the glory and the majesty of the Most Holy Trinity. And some from other religions would say, well, how dare you try to represent God with an image? Well, part of our response is our Holy God, the Most Holy Trinity, chose to step into to time, you could say, to, to reveal himself and to do his works in time to save us, and, and this is the, the works of God is, is called salvation history. And so we would say that what we have in the Rublev icon or any depiction of, of, of God in sacred art is we have the action of the Trinity in time, the action of the Trinity in salvation history. So it's an icon that shows the Trinity's saving action in time. So that's again why, uh, Cardinal Raniero Cantalamesa, who is the papal preacher, by the way, he's been since St. John Paul II. That's why he says that uh, the Trinity in salvation history. Okay, so let's let's take a look. Let's take a look at this beautiful icon, this, this little window into heaven, into the mystery of the most holy Trinity, and let's see what we see. So just let's just take a let's just start with the initial impressions. First of all, there's a certain simplicity to this image. It's not very cluttered. Um, and part of the simplicity too is the simplicity of, of these three beings, persons. They're sitting at a table doing a very simple thing, sharing a meal. And you can tell that they're in relationship. They're, they're gazing towards each other. Um, and there's, there's something sublime about the expression on their faces. Um, you, you see a deep peace uh, in this communion of three persons enjoying each other's company. Um, and, and uh, again, doing this very simple thing of, of sitting around a table, something that, again, is very common to us, you know, sitting around a table with the ones we love. They say that this icon was commissioned at a time when Russia needed peace. And they say that the uh, painting of this icon, the writing of this icon, and the release of this icon um, brought a degree of peace to Russia. And so we can gaze upon this icon and just enter into the peace and remind ourselves of, of the peace and the loving communion we're all called to as children of God made in the image and likeness of God. 
Okay, so now let's take a look at um, the reality that the Holy Trinity is equal in essence. And that's highlighted very well in this icon. I'll just read to you from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, uh, paragraph 253, very simply states, it begins by saying, the Trinity is one. We do not confess three gods, but one God in three persons, the consubstantial, uh, the consubstantial Trinity. The divine persons do not share the one divinity among themselves, but each of them is God whole and entire. And so we can look at the signs of the equality between the, within the, the, the divine persons. So let's go through it. First of all, we see that all three persons have the same form and they're the same size. So they're equal in that way. <clears throat> all three of them have the same uh, staff or um, scepter. And so you would think that if there was you know, if one was greater than the other or more important than the other or more powerful than the other or, or had a higher authority than the other, they would, there would be a distinction in their staff. Well, no. Also, the type of throne they're sitting on. It's all equal. Uh, the type of garments they're wearing, same type of garment. You know, you might find in the military that if you're a higher level in the military, you're, you have a, a different uniform. Well, it, with, with these three beings, it's the same uh, type of garment. And also, the three beings share a common color in their garments, and that's the intense blue. Now, I'm, I've just discovered that in Russian iconography, blue is the color for divinity, I guess, because maybe the sky is blue, the heavens are blue. Um, I, I think in some iconography, red is the color of, of divinity. I think I might have mentioned that in a previous uh, video. But the point is, is we see the three persons sharing this one color of blue among them. Again, pointing to their unity. Also, if you look at their faces, you might think that they're triplets. You know, that they, they their, their, their faces are, are very similar, kind of the same. And so there's the signs of, of the equality. There's obvious equality among the three divine persons, but there's also distinction. And I'll go back to the Catechism of the Catholic Church in paragraph 254. It says, the divine persons are really distinct from one another. God is one, but not solitary. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not simply names designating modalities of the divine being, but they are really distinct from one another. And so we do believe that, you know, the, the Trinity is one, uh, but three persons distinct while still being perfectly one. So let's look, look at the, th the, the distinctions. First of all, um, we see each person uh, wearing different colors is the same type of garment, but each one has different colors. And also behind each person is an object uh, representing the person and also pointing to the story of Abraham. So behind the father, you see a house. Now this points to uh, Abraham, who uh, he was in a tent. <laughs> at the time, but the, the, the home of, of Abraham, uh, but also the Father's house. Our Lord Jesus said, in the Father's house, there are many rooms. I'm gonna prepare a place for you and I'm gonna take you to myself. We'll be in the Father's house. And so behind the Father is the Father's house. Now be behind our Lord Jesus, the central um, person is the tree. Now, we know that Abraham was sitting by the oaks of Mamre, so there's the tree, the oak tree, but also our Lord Jesus 
<clears throat> he died on the cross, the tree of life. He came to make right what happened by Adam and Eve eating from uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so the Lord Jesus uh, is the new tree of life. He died on the cross, which is the tree of life. And from the tree of life, we have the fruits that, give, that heal us and give us immortality. And then behind the Holy Spirit, we have the mountain, the rock. And this makes us think of Mount Moriah, again, going back to the story of Abraham. Uh, but we also think of the call to climb the mountain of the Lord, to become holy. And we become holy by the work and the grace and the leading of the Holy Spirit. And also in the original painting, the paintings kind of had some, um, I guess you could say, touch-ups or, or uh, um, repairs the original, the rock, the mountain had a, a, a split in it. There was a crack and they say that points to Moses uh, hitting the rock with his staff and water gushing forth and water, a symbol of life and the Holy Spirit. Now you notice that um, the central figure representing our Lord Jesus and the figure on the, the right representing the Holy Spirit, they're both bowed towards the Father. Their heads are inclined towards the Father, and even the tree behind their, uh, the middle angel is bowed toward the Father, and the mountain is bowed toward the Father. So we can see um, the, the primacy of the Father in uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 245, it says, the Father as the source and origin of the whole divinity. So the, the, the Son and the Spirit proceed from the Father, and the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. So there's a, um, I guess, one term is like the monarchy of, of the Father. So there's a a headship, even though there's perfect equality, there's a, a, a primacy, a certain type of primacy of the Father that doesn't take away at all from the equality uh, of the Trinity. And so uh, we see uh, the inclination towards the Father. Now, I, I, at this point, I just want you to take a moment. Remember, we've been studying the Father and the love of the Father, and trying to grow in our love of the Father. So when we look at this icon, we can long to be there and to join the Son and the Spirit in adoring and delighting and bowing before our loving Father. And you see the Father, just this beautiful, gentle being, um, again, who's sitting uh, more upright um, and just receiving the love and, and returning love. So this is the beautiful communion of the Trinity. Now the colors, let's go through the colors. The colors that God the Father is wearing is you have the blue, but the blue is more interior. And the reason for that is because um, the, the Father is beyond description and understanding. So we, uh, uh, we, we have the glory of the Father, the blue is interior, it's kind of veiled, and the color, it's kind of like a pinkish reddish with a touch of green and gold. This kind of points to, you can't quite uh, put your finger or describe, it's, it's impossible to describe, <laughs> in a sense, the color of the Father, because again, he's, he's beyond all description and uh, uh, imagination. And so that's the colors for the Father. Now the Son, our Lord Jesus, at the center, he too, for him, the blue on the exterior is very seen because Jesus came to reveal the glory of the Father. So the blue is prominent, but also the Lord Jesus has the darkest, darkest color, the dark purple with the gold representing the, the kingship of Jesus. But the, the brownish, reddish purple represents the humanity of Christ, the earth. And then on the right, we have um, the Holy Spirit. Now in Russian iconography, green is the color of the Holy Spirit. And obviously green is also the color of new life. So the, the Spirit is the giver of life. Uh, and so that's the, the colors for the Spirit. Of course, this, the Spirit also has the divine 
blue. Now they're, again, they're sitting around a table and there's a, a chalice at the table. And this uh, reminds us of the, the, the meal that Abraham with Sarah prepared for these divine guests. But it also points to the, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And as a matter of fact, um, many interpreters of this icon have said, in this icon, we see what might be a depiction of the moment of the Father sending the Lord Jesus to save us, to drink of the cup. And when the Father sends Jesus, it's in the anointing of the Holy Spirit, because Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one. And that's why you see both um, Jesus, the, the central figure, and the Holy Spirit, they both have an arm free. Uh, the right arm of Jesus, the left arm of the Holy Spirit, and these represent the arms of the Father. The Father, by sending His Son and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, is reaching out to us through the Son and the Holy Spirit. The bottom of the icon, at the, at the table, there's that little square. That represents the place in an altar where the martyr's um, relic is placed. And this is a reminder that every one of us as Christians were meant to follow the Lord Jesus, which is the way of the cross in laying our life down. Uh, every one of us, our life is to be a, a kind of a martyrdom. Now, one of the beautiful things about this icon is um, it's drawn in a way that you get the sense there's a person missing at the table. And you can say, well, maybe that's Abraham and Sarah. Uh, but an interpretation is, is the person missing at the table, there's room for someone else at the table, well, that's you. The Holy Spirit invites um, the person gazing upon this uh, icon to join the Trinity in this loving, peaceful, sublime communion. And so that's what we should experience when we gaze upon the Rublev icon of the Trinity, um, a love for the persons of the Trinity. We see that, that they come in peace, they come in love, they come even in, in simplicity. And they, they invite us to join in communion and love with them. Okay, there's so much more that can be said about this icon. Whole books have been written about it. But why don't we just leave it at that for today. And uh, hopefully this has given you a deeper uh, appreciation for this beautiful icon. And so, uh, may Almighty God bless you now, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Viva Cristore! One thing I forgot to mention is that in the icon, there's um, an obvious chalice, the shape of the, uh, the Father and the Spirit makes a chalice, and our Lord Jesus is in that chalice. And that's obviously a sign of the Lord Jesus' sacrifice for us. And also there's a kind of a wonderful uh, sense of a circle uh, which represents the trinity uh, eternity uh in this icon um so those are two important things they needed to be mentioned so there you go